Hello there, everyone. I hope you're all doing well and having a good evening so far. We're just getting everything started. Uh, appreciate everyone's patience so far. Um, this evening, we're going to have a great one. We're going to have a panel on um, the science of Hollywood with the authors of Hollyweird Science. Actually, there's two volumes already out. You can get them on Amazon and a third edition getting ready to come out. Um, and we've got ourselves, in addition to Adam Savage, who will be moderating. We also have... Uh, Stephen Cass, who's senior editor of IEEE Spectrum. We have uh, Dr. Jessica Kale, um, science advisor for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Zootopia. Uh, Dr. Kevin Grazier, who is science advisor for Battlestar Galactica, Gravity, um, and Eureka, and a number of other shows. And it's going to be a great conversation. Everybody, feel free to chat in the side conversations. We'll be pulling out questions there and feeding them along. And Adam will touch them as we um, have a chance to get to them. And everyone, let's have a great time. So let's start off by welcoming in. Uh, we'll start off with Adam. Hey there, Adam. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just like still writing, furiously writing questions. How are you, Bill? Doing good, doing good. Ready for an evening. So I'm with without further ado, I'll bring everyone Absolutely. else in and we'll get things started. Thank you guys. Oh hey. hello everybody. Hey. Greetings. Hey. Oh. Hey. Um, you know, I know I, I want to start out by saying I know that um you guys do cons like I do cons, and you've done panels like this in the past. Uh, and and at a con, right, there's all these different cultures. There's the culture of attending, there's the culture of appearing, the culture of being on stage, and then there's the culture of the green room. And within the culture of the green room, there's two different tracks. There's like the celebrities that you spot, and then there's the people you could just talk to for like hours and hours. And this is the group that like, I just want to be stuck in a green room during a blackout so that we could chat about whatever we wanted for hours. Um, we're not going to get to everything, but Jessica, Stephen, Kevin, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Pleasure. Here. Um, I, I, yes. Can we start just by talking about the, re the, the thing that brought you guys here, being a science advisor for Hollywood, what the hell does that mean? Can you each give me kind of like what, what you thought that was going to be and what it actually was? Okay, Kevin, why don't you start? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I had uh, uh, sort of run in the same circles as Andre Bormanis, who is the track science advisor. So I kind of had an idea of, of sort of what I, you know, I'd heard the, the rumors. And um, so what happened um, way back when, this is going to be a little bit kind of a long version because it's going to contrast Jessica's, how she got in is, is completely different and more hopeful than how I got in. For, for people who want to do this. Um, so back in grad school, I was grad school at UCLA, go Bruins. Um, the Paramount had a, a, um, a way that you could send in unsolicited manuscripts for their Star Trek series. And they said, you know, we'll make you two promises. It'll get read and you'll get it back. And apart from that, you know, we get 3000 a year and a good outcome happens to single digits. So it's not, you know, so a friend and I, my friend Jess and I, we we wrote a script, we sent it in, and forgot about it because I was a busy grad student. He was uh, he was an Air Force officer, at Wright Patterson, and and then we got a call back saying, "Hey, we'd like to come in and pitch." So, um, yay! And so we we pitched several times, and two of the people to whom I pitched most was the person I worked with Battle on Battlestar um, wrote what I think is the best episode of Star Trek ever. Michael Taylor wrote Deep Space Nine: The Visitor. I pitched to him many times. But I also pitched to Brian Fuller, that Brian Fuller, the you know, and um, and both of them in their first jobs in the industry. So then, when um, Ron Moore was doing his um, his recreated, you know, renewed Battlestar, um, his his uh, reimagined Battlestar, I went to his Galacticon presentation, which has become legendary for how badly he got treated. Um, in fact, they even made fun of it in an episode of CSI. So yeah, um, Ron's in the episode too. If you go space oddity, it's worth your time to see Ron Moore tell this guy you suck. He's got two words in the episode. Anyway, so um, I had kept in contact with Brian and I asked Brian, would you ever so kindly be willing to put in a word for me with Ron? Because I'd like, love to be their science advisor. And that's a complete lie. It's hard to more, please, Brian, please, 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 please. And he did. And with Brian's you know, thumbs up, my interview was like five minutes and oh, wow. um, 
and Ron hired me. And, and then, and then after that, it's the first, once with the first job, they shared the, the rock Hudson building with Eureka. And so I, at lunch, two people were talking and that's how I got hired on Eureka. And then wait, wait, once, yeah, couple, I had a bunch of friends on that show. That's hilarious. Well, of course. Um, uh, of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jessica. Uh, I got into it uh, at my first San Diego Comic-Con, actually my first big con. And I happened to be attending a science of science fiction panel where they were just ripping apart bad science fiction with science laughing at it and you know and uh, a woman got up at the end and it was a woman from the national academy of sciences which for the people who aren't familiar was founded by abraham lincoln it's been around for a long time and they um they opened a branch out here in la about a decade ago that is um meant to interface between scientists and entertainment to try to it's called the science and entertainment exchange it's meant to uh try to improve the scientific literacy in the united states by improving the the science in our fiction and mm -hmm. making it a little bit more accurate it's sort of slipping a little bit of you know science vegetables into the toddler's meal without them noticing and so uh, she got up and said, hey, if there are any scientists in the room, we would love you to, to sign up for this agency and we'll just keep you in the Rolodex to whenever we have a question that meets your field. So I, I actually, my friend forced me up there. I'm like, no, 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 no. She's like, you've got a PhD in neuroscience. Go up there and tell her that. So yeah, I went up and they put me in the Rolodex and I, because my background has a lot of, um, well, not a lot of, but for several years I worked with a military um, on uh, pharmaceutical enhancement of performance, so super soldiery kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and also um, physiological detection of lie lying, so how to fool a lie detector test. And because I worked in those two fields, I get a lot of those calls, like, you know, w what's in what's in Captain America's super serum, or you know, what brain right. changes does Bruce Banner go through when he turns into the Hulk? or you know a lot of brain and neuroscience and and so that's my specialty drugs in the brain <laughs> drugs in the brain cool so i'm the one that they call on all of those weird you know we've got sometimes it's really established and it's frustrating because they'll call me from quite a ways into production and they'll say hey uh we already established this blue substance which is going to be has to be consumed orally and it has to do this to them but now we need to know we need the scientists in the show to say what the heck it is uh can you make that work and you kind of have to just go back and make it work right and that's actually an aspect of this job i really want to talk about about balancing those it's things. super creative oh yeah i could totally imagine i've got so many questions steven talk to us about your origin story so yeah, so I came into this. Um, I'm a, a science and technology journalist, actually, for my day job. And I slowly sort of began bringing in science fiction elements of it when I was at Discover Magazine, and we launched a blog called Science Not Fiction. And what was great about that was that the the, the guy Henry Donahue, who was running um, the magazine at that stage, you know, really had this rule about no nerd gassing. That this was going to be a science fiction centered thing, but we were not going to be nitpicking things to death because that was just getting boring and, and unpleasant. It's like, how could we talk about these things? And that kind of set me down the road. And now, now I work for a magazine called IEEE Spectrum, which I show, which is, the be I like to often say this, it's the best magazine you've never heard of, but the fun thing about cons and science fiction people is there's always somebody in the audience who's like an avid reader. So that's always always a bit of fun. You guys you guys took me to South by Southwest the first time I that's went. That's right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. So, so the IEEE is a, is a secretly cool organization, although it does hide it well with like a name like the IEEE. But um, so one of the things like as a professional science journalist, is you very quickly, and technology journalists, is you very quickly realize you cannot understand modern science and technology, the real trends, what's going on, without actually understanding a little bit of science science fiction, I think. Neil Stevenson said it best when he said, like, science fiction is like a kind of a, a magnetic field that aligns people and mm -hmm. into sort of certain shared visions. And it becomes a very, very quick shorthand for people to talk about. Like, even at very serious conferences, you can talk about the Terminator problem. And everybody right. understands that as a shorthand for talking about lethal robot applications and what's real and what's not. So, so it's really become important, I think, to 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 think about science fiction, what it's telling us, and the good messages, the bad messages, and, and sort of breaking that down. And that's what I've been doing with the uh, with Kevin and Jessica for, for these last few years. So now, 
this thing that was brought up earlier about nitpicking i mean this is this is the nerd pastime is to <laughs> is to sit down in front of beloved franchises and pick some nits <laughs> but when you're doing it professionally um as you were saying jessica there are all these things to balance and so i'm i'm sure that each of you has has helped bring solutions about that were compromises between the narrative and the science and i'd like to hear examples because you know we can watch a movie i i like talking about gravity specifically because i love the plot so much i found it way more involving than than interstellar and i know that gravity has a a a, a reputation for being a little fast and furious with its delta v Whereas Interstellar worked so hard, you know, these are all lines that are super personal and subjective. And I, I just would love to hear your experiences drawing those lines and, and coming to them with production. Okay, well, let's talk about gravity. I, I actually totally. had a Battlestar Galactica example I was going to use, but gravity is fine too because I got a great gravity example. Um, I was, when I first met Alfonso and Jonas Cuaron, um, I met them in the. Um, there's a, a famous hotel on Sunset that I'm blanking on, Chateau Marmont. I met them in the, in the, the lobby there, and we were just sitting there, and they had a laptop and animatics, and, and I got to see the scene where where um, Stone wriggles out of her um, uh, space suit years before it was actually even shot because it was an animatic. But we were talking about just what they want to do. And you know, I, I mentioned that, so this is in the first meeting, that you realize that the, these two orbits of Hubble and ISS, at their closest point, their you know their near, nearest intersection, the this will never happen in real life closest distance is roughly here to the border, right. and you're never getting there on one backpack of gas. And they said, yeah, yeah, we know, we we, we get that. And I said, well, here's an idea, you know, and, and so I, I sort of you know throw this out there. And this was you know a little later, I, I realized here's something we can do. I said, and you know, it's always about the story. It's about making, you know, it's about not getting the science perfect, it's about getting it as right as possible and still allowing them to tell the story they want to tell. And they were motivated by seeing the IMAX film of the Atlantis Hubble servicing mission. And they wanted to recreate that, the danger, the thrill, the grandeur, good, bad, and indifferent, everything about space. And I said, well, hey, here's an idea. By the time this movie airs, we know that the uh, shuttle will no longer be flying so it's a reasonable design consideration that the next generation space telescope be in an orbit more easily serviceable from the space station. So why don't we do this? Why don't we create a fictitious space telescope? And in keeping with our, our female, our strong female lead, let's name it the Canon Space Telescope for Annie Cannon, the, the an early astronomer. And then once we have that, we hit a Canon camera for product placement dollars. <laughs> And Mr. Quarles said, you missed your calling. You should have been a producer. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer was no, because we're trying to maintain the grandeur of this IMAX movie. That was their motiv motivator. Um, and so they they made that choice. There was right there. It was a, a creative choice um, because we know you can't get there from here. Right. But if you can't get there from here in the movie, you don't really have anything to reach for. You have a different movie. You have open water in space where wetsuits become spacesuits and circling sharks become orbital debris. And I don't like that movie as much because they die. You know, what I love about that is I've had people call me up who work on reality shows and say, oh, my producer wants me to do this thing that doesn't work in this show. I don't like it. And I said, your producer's just trying to do their job. Oh, you don't need to not do what they want you to do. You just need to bring them a better solution. They yeah. want the better solution. Our, um, our job is to make things plausible-ish. Right. <laughs> you know, like our job isn't to red pen their writing and change the story so that it's a dissertation because that's not entertaining. Our job is to go and take what they give us and figure out a plausible piece of the puzzle that will fit into their puzzle, but it's their puzzle. Um, are you also thinking about um, kids or young people watching this and the way in which they'll, the way in which they'll sort of physicalize what they see on state on on the screen? 
I do. And especially females, you know, I'm trying to be yeah. a model for women in STEM and, you know, normalize that more. And I, I mean, let's face it, a lot of this, a lot of the people in the writer's room are not scientifically experts. And so you already have to write things to a certain non-expertise level anyway. So if you're doing that, it's not hard to write it a little further into something that could be understood by anybody. Right. Um, Jessica, I'm curious about an, uh, uh, about uh, a story you might have about that compromise with a producer, with a production. Uh, let me think. Okay, so in Iron Fist, the bad guy there is a woman named Madame Gao who uh, is importing a importing drugs. She's a drug dealer, and they have already established that there's this new drug on the street that hits addicts harder than they've ever hit. It's just the rush of a lifetime, and she's just rapidly cornering the market from all the other drug bobs. So they come to me and say, what is it? <laughs> and how does it work? <laughs> oh, by the way, it's got to be a patch you stick on your arm. We like that. So, I'm, okay. Uh, all right. So it's got to be transdermal. It's got to be an opiate. But it's got to be something that they, they had already set up a scene that they really loved where they try to pitch this substance and they bring in this, this just grizzled addict who's been, you know, tracks up and down his arms. He's clearly been around the block on, uh, you know, using heroin a lot. And they're like, yeah, so what? It's a new drug. I've seen it all. And they say, give it to him. And they stick the patch on him and he just poof, eyes roll back and full on like first trip ever kind of newbie experience. And they sign up immediately and buy the rest of the product. So they needed something that could do that. So, you know, it was my job to figure out, okay, well, transdermal patches are a thing. We can make that work. Um, what would make a, a newbie what would make a long-term user of heroin be like a newbie user and feel like the first time? Well, you know, what's making a long-term user likely a long-term user? It's the liver enzymes having built up and learned to, to tolerate that drug. If we could block those liver enzymes, maybe they'd be hit like a first-timer. So it was a patch mixed with liver enzyme inhibitors and, you know, and, and a new synthetic opiate, which was, you know, extra potent. And it's plausible-ish, and they used it. Oh wow! I, there, uh, uh, is there ever a case where there's like one writer in the room who loves everything you gave them and tries to write all of it in? Yeah, there is. There is, and then sometimes, sometimes they'll spin it. I, I, I jokingly talk about one of my first consults was on Agents of Shield, and they needed the substance that would be consumed by Doctor Hyde that would turn him in Daisy's father, Quake's father, turn him into you know Jet from Jekyll into Hyde. And um, it had already been oral. It had already been colored blue. They just needed to know what was in it. And so I gave them similar, you know, it's oral, so it's got to interfere with the liver enzyme so it doesn't break it down. So you can, because you can't, they wanted it to be a steroid. So I'm like, all right, it's a synthetic steroid. I gave them a whole recipe for it. And then when they had Fitz and Simmons talk about it, and as the scientist characters on the show, they... Um, Altered, they weedenized it a little bit, and they worked in my formula plus uh, gorilla testosterone and a hint of mint. <laughs> <laughs> Which, frankly, I would have worked in if I had thought of it, but it was just, I loved it. And so I'm watching the show, of course, like all the other nerds, going, that's my recipe. That's not my <laughs> recipe, but I love it. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, uh, S Stephen, I'd love to hear a, a so, story about compromising on this side. Yeah, no, that's a good example. So this actually, uh, this is the, the point you're making about maybe it's sometimes it's better to be moving than accurate. So there's like a classical, very old um, historical example that he, we're all familiar with um, Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night. Okay, it's this beautiful picture and so on. So there's a lot of pretty good art scholarship that, that shows how, how that painting was really strongly influenced by observations made by the Earl of Ross, who... Um, at the time, what had this, this what was the largest telescope in the world until uh, Mount Palomar? It was in Ireland, which is a terrible place for a telescope, but nonetheless, he persisted, and he did some of the first the first drawings of inter of of, of what we now call galaxies, um, and he drew them as nebulae. So this is there was a picture he drew a, an illustration of what he saw as what we now call the M fifty one galaxy, and it was a kind of a it's a, it's kind of a very stark black and white sketching that was actually widely reproduced in popular science books of the of the time and there's some evidence that vincent van gogh saw that and that was part of his inspiration because if you look at the swirls moving around it actually is very reminiscent of the of the m51 galaxy if you go back and check it but the point is is that if you compare the 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 earl of ross's little sketch versus starry night 
you're going to go for starry night every time, despite the fact that, you know, the apparent magnitude is wrong, the, you know, the, the size, the, the space is taking up over, like the angular diameter is completely wrong. Is this guy ever bothered to go outside and look at the stars? They're all completely wrong. This guy is an idiot. How can he possibly maintain, call this starry night? He should be ashamed. So it's like, it's not, but it's, it's like, we should look at, I think science fiction is something inspired by science. The closer it gets to science is the better. But if you are like breaking what makes it worth watching in the first place for the sake of accuracy, you are doing everybody a disservice. There's a place for accuracy and that's like in the, in the nonfiction world. But when you want to like tell a story, don't go crazy or you, you just kill what's fun in the first place. But I mean, also, there's actually a really interesting lesson in here about science, because each of us comes to understanding whatever it is we're understanding, we come to it in our own weird, specific, circuitous way. And culturally, we think of science as this monolith of facts. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you guys all understand it as a process, as a as a mm -hmm. as a procedure, as a community. Uh, it, it exists temporally, right? Uh, right? And within that, whatever it takes to get us across that line of understanding, it doesn't have to be perfectly accurate as long as we mm -hmm. understand it with our bodies. You know. And you know, if you're a science advisor on a, on a TV series or a film, you'll get more than a few opportunities to set the record straight on here's the real scoop. Like you might write a series of books called Hollywood Science. You know, so <laughs> the opportunities that arise to talk about real science far outweigh the one, you know, thing that eh, isn't quite right. Right. I, I, you know, I have to be in the basement right now because I live in Huntsville, Alabama and, and things are, the weather out here is a little on the extreme side today. So I don't have access to my books or I would be, you know, I don't have a cool background. I have a rat cage. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I'm curious about the worst science that you guys have seen in a film that was supposed to be quote unquote accurate. Can I start? Because I have a, yeah, this is, there's a situation where yeah. I went on a complete rant in the book and Stephen basically had to talk me off the ledge. <laughs> one of the things, as far as our books go, we view them as a depiction of science, scientists, and the culture of science. And I would argue that based on things we've already talked about, the last two are at least as important as the first. How yeah. The culture of science um, in particular. Um, and the one movie that just set me off was Red Planet with Val Kilmer. Because, uh, oh my God. Now, let's talk about this. We're talking cultural science and scientists, right? Let's ignore any science. Let's talk about the scientists in that movie, okay? So we have two. In the first opening monologue, we have Carrie Ann Moss telling us that uh, about the crew, right? We have the, I can't remember the actor's name. He's the older scientist who he has given up science. He is now on a, a journey of philosophy. Then he's dead mass. You don't need him to lift his sorry ass off Earth, let alone get all the way to Mars. He is not pulling his weight from the word go by definition. Okay? And, and of course, what does he do? He dies on impact. <laughs> well, so, and then, and then all gets better. Because then we have the, the xeno, xenobiologist who was a last minute replacement instantly shooting in the foot the best and brightest argument Carrie Ann Moss had just made. And what does he do? Oh, well, let's see. They have one science conversation en route to get opportunity for the philosopher to be somewhat philosophical, and they botch that. And the one of the scientists, number, you know, number two guy, is passed out drunk. And then when they get to Mars, one guy dies instantly, and the other guy is guilty of the first murder on Mars. <laughs> and did... <laughs> <laughs> It's two decades old. I think we're beyond the reasonable oh, limit. You 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 bring up a thing that was the was was the biggest problem for me about um, uh, Promete Covenant, Alien Covenant, mm -hmm. was that the scientist who gets there and sees the alien body is disappointed that it's not alive. I'm like, that is not. <laughs> That is not a response. That's not even right. a wrong response. Mm -hmm. And in the first movie, the, the, the xenobiologist looks at the alien killing machine and basically says, here, puppy, puppy, puppy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jessica, your favorite terrible movie science. Oh, I, I hate bad-mouthing science, but um, 
actually, with the this kind of ties that in. It's hard to do, right? Yeah. All right. Let, let, like, I see. I see that there is a question on the feed that it's talking about. Is there an uncanny valley in science, like there is in CG, where you know the closer it gets to reality, the more you detect that it's off? Oh, I would say right. the answer to these bo both questions would be: it depends on if it's your science that you know about or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, so, yeah. like for me, Lucy is the most egregious travesty of science that there is. You know, we it perpetuates the stupid. We use only ten percent of our brains. It implies that you know using a few more percent would give us you know telepathy and time travel, and it's just it's ridiculous. Oh. I didn't Lucy want to the walk movie, not Australopithecus. Oh no, 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 Australopithecus <laughs> is fine. That Lucy was fine. No, the movie. <laughs> And so, yeah, it, it's just terrible. We use 10% of our brains and it just perpetuates mm. all that stuff. And um, there was a television show called Lie to Me, which I loved. Um, and it was about, you know, micro expressions and lie detection. And having mm. done that research, I was really into it. And everything in there was extremely well researched. And, and there was one scene where they were talking about, um, are there any drugs that could be used to fool a lie detector test? And they said, no, no, there, there aren't. You know, we can't mm. do that. And I went, yes, there are. <laughs> I published that report. It is. And then I went, as I'm yelling at the screen, I went, wait a minute, they made that official use only. That is, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, classified. <laughs> so I realized, okay, you're, you're forgiven for getting that wrong because you can't read that report. <laughs> I don't even know if I have clearance to read it anymore. So the answer to the question is nobody else in the room would be bothered by those two things unless it's their science that's getting, you know, trampled. Yeah. Yeah, um, that, that, that's that's a good, that, that's exactly. So I'm more of a tech a technology person, and so in many ways, and so I get a good example of a movie where everybody loved the science, but it it drove me like nuts, and I had to like kind of like let it go. Was Europa Report? So people people that was very well reviewed, very well critically reviewed. But the spaceship is the most poorly designed spaceship in the, in the history. There's of so much crash. room. So much off, room in that thing. First off, there's so much room. But first off, they have like a hydrogen leak is lethal. It's like it's not like hydrogen hydrogen is a surprise. Like like it's it's a known containment issue on the ISS. So they have like ways to deal with it. You don't die if you get hydrazine on the outside of your suit. We know that today. And then they had they had they had this weird life support system, which was somehow directly attached to the communication system. So you could do one or the other. Everything was single string. And then there was the idea that, okay, we're in space. No one will know we're here until the end. And I'm like, you are a you're in a spacecraft, which means you are in a giant, you're a, from the point of view of Earth, you are in a very hot very like you're emitting all kinds of radio waves, you're emitting all kinds of terms. You would be a beacon on any kind of like reasonable earth observation. They would know where you were to the meter. You could turn on and off your lights and do Morse code to go, <laughs> to go back to earth realistically. So, you know, so, so, so those kind of things drove me. I'm like, no, no, Cam, just enjoy the things it does get right. And that's what I find works for me for movies is I try to focus on what they do get right and not so much worry about the, about the rest. Well, so when I, I had in... one thing, um, yeah, yeah, before, please, please. just hold your spoiler sign. This is a, in the third Hollywood science book, we make a point that I think is kind of flown under the radar. And that is um, when they try to use genetic uh, uh, justifications for superhero powers, right? That we have all this junk DNA, you tweak that. How is that not a biological equivalent of the 90 cent myth? Mm. Or 10 percent myth. Right. It is. Um, it's, the same, it's the same argument. So, so when I worked in special effects, I, I often built stuff, and I frequently built stuff that was meant to be blown up. And people would ask me, like, uh, do, you, do you mind blowing your stuff up? And I'd say, no, that's the job. I built something to be blown up. And people asked me if going to the movies once I worked on them changed my perception. And it didn't really. My suspension of disbelief is the same as it's always been. But I'm curious if you guys are more or less tolerant of bad or weird science that you see in the movies now, and why? Uh, I think we, we, Kevin and I talk about the stages of sort of the, the cycles of reaching, we call it nirvana. So there was certainly a phase, for instance, where my wife refused to watch um, certain movies with me because I would because they would show some stock footage. I'd go, this is this is supposed to be a, an advanced spacecraft, but that's a 1957 Jupiter C launch, you know. And she's like, oh, love of God, um, <laughs> you know. So I think there's like like, like there's been an evol there's an evolution in in sort of understanding of some of these things. Like when I was in college, um, yeah, I was very much that kind of that very nitpicky 
kind of person. I think as I've got older and as I become a journalist, I understand storytelling. I understand the history of technology. I understand how science often cheats blatantly in order to convey information. So we're told a certain model of the atom in schools that is very different from the kind of the quantum mechanical model you get taught if you go on to college. Or many people have seen a model of the solar system. They're sold as educational toys. Have you seen the scale of those things? They're ridiculous. Like they fit inside a room. This is, this is crazy. You know, the, if the sun is this size, you know, the, the furthest toy should be out in the next neighbor's back garden. So there's a lot of times where for educational reasons, very legitimate scientific reasons, we take certain shortcuts and we allied things. And I think when I started applying that to like how science fiction, and I started understanding the, the storytelling, I'm sure, I'm sure Jessica and Kevin can talk a little bit, like you can only like, you have to service characters, you've got budgets, you've got all of these issues. Um, I became much more chill about it, I think. You know, and and Jess, I didn't mean, did I, did I jump on you? You're on no, the, go for uh, it. Okay. Um, the understanding the genre helps you manage expectations too. I consider Star Wars fantasy, so I'm okay with lightsabers. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I get asked all the time, how can you sit through a Harry Potter movie? Because I love Harry Potter movies because they're magic, it's, it's fantasy. I'm not yeah. in science mode. Um, and, and so understanding the genre and, and what the science is. And another point is, um, we were I was interviewing um, Narain Shankar for, um, we used some of his stuff in the second book, we'll use a lot more of it in the third book. And we were talking, he, he got his start as a science advisor on Next Generation. Um, he was there for a year until they got him. They brought him into the writers' room, and he said, "Can, can I use it? Can I use a four-letter word?" Oh, go ahead. Okay. okay. When we were talking about Star Trek and being a science advisor on Star Trek, he said, "Science advisor on Star Trek isn't about fidelity to real-world science. It's about the consistency of made-up shit. So it's less important mm -hmm. to be faithful to the laws of this universe." Than it is to the laws of your universe. Right. Mm -hmm. So had, there, if, yes, if, if they ahead, have a problem with the lithium and, and they've already said something else, I'm all. But if you know <laughs> they say there's the burn, you know that okay, I'm I'm good. You know, I well, yeah. tell me about this burn thing. Mm -hmm. I had the most creative consult that I've ever had to do um, just this last year. And it was on a show called Claws, which is not a show I would think of as sci-fi sci or anything. It's about uh, a bunch of manicurists getting stumbling into the uh, drug trade in Florida mm. and trying to sort of picture Breaking Bad, but they're really incompetent. Uh, but they're trying to trying to start their own mob, basically, mm -hmm. with this. So anyway, they're they're trying to take over their own meth. And so I got a call saying, look, we've got, um, we, we need to figure out a way where you could give a meth manicure, where they could come into this manicure shop, and it would look like they were just painting their nails. But in reality, they were infusing them with meth, and they'd walk out all tripped out, but nobody could arrest them, because it looks like they're just going in there and doing what that business was made for. So... Uh, I had to come up with a whole, like, that's the most reaching I've ever had to do to come up with a way to like, how do I get meth through the fingernails? All right, maybe through the cuticles. Well, maybe they have to. So I just came up with the most plausible ish stuff I could. Um, I'm curious about moments in which you were pleasantly surprised by a bit of science being communicated on screen. Uh, Stephen. So a, a great example of this in terms of like, which goes back to like, you know, what, what, what my standards are and where do I like where do I give you know a little bit of grace was I, I was really surprised that they didn't need it was a, a Mr. Robot so there was an early episode of Mr. Robot oh, yeah. where, 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 where he comes in and he says right we're going to hack into the to the giant you know evil corp data data center and we're going to do it using this and he holds up like a little circuit board and the circuit board happened to be ras was was a raspberry pi and i thought okay here's a classic case where the props guy has just gone online and just bought the first thing that looks kind of cool and it's going to be called the quantum zipper zapper magic tron 2000 and the next line is it's a, the next line is that's a raspberry pi what are you going to do with it ah well let me tell you and i'm like okay i i'm 100 down vested in your show you know what Raspberry Pi is. You know it's an okay. It's a kind of an okay kind of computer for what you're trying to do, and you're going to be really clever with it. And that was the moment where I, I, I just, you, I have, I will follow you show to the ends of the earth. Um, I'm curious about moments in which, I mean, for. I'm curious about moments in which you consider when which you guys each learn something from the science in a movie. 
like mm-hmm. a movie gave you a better perspective of something you didn't know about. Uh, yeah, th- there was a recent, it, it, it did not make season two, but Netflix just had a show about um, a mission to Mars, um, mm-hmm. like a long duration thing. And actually they, they had they had issues where where somebody comes down with Epstein-Barr virus, and then another issue where, where guys, like the, 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 all the skin in his foot sort of sloughs away. And I went and I looked it up, and actually those are like very, especially the Epstein-Barr is very, I thought this is, this, this sounds a little reachy. And I went and no, like like long exposure in, in space flight, can reactivate some of these viruses specifically on this. And I thought, oh, I did not know that at all. I thought I knew quite a bit about long duration space flight, but nope, thank you very much for, for, for giving me. There was actually a whole bunch of like little things like that in it where I thought, oh, these guys have really like dug into some of the literature. Like they've, they've pulled out some, some, some stuff here. I remember uh, being. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. No, I'm just trying to think of, of, of uh, something because they have to kind of have to go back a ways to, you know. Um, uh, I mean, I learned from Star Trek that any proton beam, is, you know, is a uh, uh, is antimatter. You know, and there is um, is. Uh, I had a point I was going to make there, and I, I just completely spaced it. Um, <laughs> remember the anti-proton beam from the Planet Killer? Your oh, okay. Yep. Proton. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So those are basically just you know, hydrogen atoms with a negative charge. Um, that's, when I looked at it, that, that's, that's what I remember, like, oh, that's really cool. Um, and it's real and it's Star Trek. And so, you know, back then I was like, Star Trek can do no, can do no wrong. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's a lot of, I learned some things and, and you know, to me for, for a while when I was a, a youngster, Star Trek was like the end all and be all science fiction. I was that kid. And, uh, and so, yeah, I learned a lot of things that, that I went and looked up and then spent hours in the dictionary from, from Star Trek. But recently, I can't really think of anything. Partly because we do a lot of research for the Hollywood science books, sure, of course. and um, it's it's kind of hard to get surprised because we do a lot of re- you know a lot of reading and a lot of watching. Uh, what about places like visualizations? I remember uh, the movie The Time Machine uh, had some beautiful illustrations of Earth, like changing the topography <laughs> of Earth, changing from Pangaea and on. <laughs> are there? Are, and a lot of that stuff is usually trotted out at the beginning of a technology, right? Like the famous mm-hmm. Wrath of Khan planet growing sequence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you, you, it must be really exciting to you watch that that kind of thing get better and better and better as movies get better at telling that kind of visual story. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I actually had sort of this a similar conversation last night with somebody who there was a, an, an, a, a um, video. There's a, two videos, and and um, I, I'm going to actually I'll allude to them in the third Hollywood Science book because I just we'll finish up a chapter on chemistry, speaking of explosions, and um, and it's like 29,000 words long, it's huge. But we're talking about the chemistry of film, and then um, I use, using the movie Steve Jobs as an example, where they had three, two different film formats and a digital format to convey the, not only the different time periods, but the improving technology. So we talked, we, you know, our editor asked me to do a comparison between the resolution of film, versus, which doesn't really have a resolution, versus yeah. the resolution yeah. of digital. But then there's a counter argument to that. And there's um, two, a couple of videos, a two part video about, about um, improving the resolution in TV and film. Um, and I have some issues with the, I, I agree with where he starts. I agree with his conclusion that once you reach a point of diminishing returns, you don't need, you know, 30 K resolution at some point, you, you know, you're going to lose the ability to see the difference between that and, and, and 10 K or even 5 K. But, um, so, so, um, but the, the, the thing is with, with me, um, I watch an old tube TV. It's a 44 inch tube TV and I'm okay with that. So, yeah. you know, so like, go, you know, back to your thing about going on with improving technology. Sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm, I still watch Blake seven and I'm okay with those special effects. <laughs> um, think- so, so at some point in time, so yes, I, well, I appreciate the technology and I appreciate um, some of the, some of the technology is just, I, I'm, it's lost on me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To be honest. I Jessica, think it's kind of funny. Something? Coming, uh, my husband does special effects, and so um, sometimes what I do consulting for the science of something and what he does are on opposite ends of the same show. He's doing post Mm -hmm. and I'm doing pre, Mm. and uh, Iron Fist happened to be one of those. You know, Iron Fist, they're trying to place it in the super grounded Marvel universe of Daredevil and just gritty Luke Cage kind of thing, but... In the middle of Jessica Jones, you know, alcoholic, traumatized, um, you know, Luke Cage and and uh, Daredevil, you've got this 
guy that punched an immortal dragon in the heart and has glowing hands. Like, how are you going to ground that in reality? <laughs> so um, when they brought me in to try to help them with the science of how, how that works, um, you know, I gave them a whole bunch of suggestions, none, none of which they took. They just decided to, because I said so is the, is the way to go with it. And just like, it's magical. Just don't look behind those curtains. Um, but at the end of that, uh, my husband was working at the special effects house where they had to come up with the glowing hands. And of course, we're both technically NDA'd. I'm not supposed to tell him what I'm working on. He's not supposed to tell me what I'm working, what he's working on. But I go to pick him up for lunch and I'm like, hey, that's Luke Cage. Those are the glowing hands I worked on for, whoo! you know, and then, so we finally, <laughs> we got permission to be able to talk to each other. And because they're only sending him a little snippet of, you know, his hands glowing and he has no idea what they should look like. And I'm like, well, you know, he, he brings me into the office and says, my wife just happened to have done the science for this. So would you like her to consult with you? So, But it, it didn't matter. They just ended up saying, you know, because magic and they glow. So uh, um, I have Jen, one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, go I ahead. I have one very, very specific visualization that I actually use to mark the progress of, of computer graphics, and that is the moment at which I die in movies. So I, I work in I work in Midtown Manhattan, and I work in this in this uh, tall red brick building, which is actually very close to the Empire State Building. So it inevitably gets it's kind of distinctive, and inevitably gets included in a lot of like the meshes and maps and so on that are digitally done. So I like to watch, and I like to watch big disaster movies, and the exact moment when the wave comes, or in Avengers, uh, for instance, when the space whale comes around and takes out a building, that's my movie. So I go, oh, I died right there. So, so the, the visualization of my own death in horrific city destroying disasters is my personal. <laughs> Thing that I watch out for. That's a better answer than I could have possibly hoped for. <laughs> I can't remember what movie it is. I can't remember what movie it is, but it's the one where the Statue of Liberty's head goes bouncing right. through the street and not. And my husband did that, so he killed you. Oh wow! Okay, that was that was <laughs> uh, no, not Armageddon. It was the other one. It was I think it was the other one. He did, I can't remember. Yeah, yes, but anyway, yeah, he, killed, yeah. he killed you in that one. Yeah, there we um, go. Okay. Clover, Cloverfield, maybe. Oh, Cloverfield, yes, Cloverfield. I died in Cloverfield too. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and maybe you guys don't know, but I was killed by production at the in the finale of season two of The Expanse, uh, floating in the blackness of space. <laughs> Oh, lucky you. How cool is yeah, that? I have to play a yeah. mission specialist, and then my ship gets taken apart by the protomolecule. Spoilers. Uh, and you get to see me. Um, thank you. Jessica, I wanted to talk about Zootopia. It is one of my favorite movies. I love that film. I'm going to disappoint um, you. Everything I gave them, none of it was used. Oh, <laughs> oh. Well, okay, but, but is there uh, the thing that I one of the things I I was excited about that about that film was that they changed the plot and redid the movie almost from scratch. Yeah, in I was the pre pre scratch. I was the pre scratch consultant. It was all going to be about hypnosis, and oh, I think well, wow. NDA is long. It, it was going to be like this, um, almost like this equilibrium like hypnosis that made the predators cool. and the prey get along with each other, almost like equilibrium pill that makes everybody kind of flat and, and, and passionless. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they decided to go a different way with that. Oh my goodness. Cause I was picturing in my head that you got a frantic call. We got to redo the science, Jessica. Uh, Here comes the no. new script. I wish, but oh. nope, nope, sorry. Um, here's what I not to do as a science advisor, by the way. So in a similar vein, uh, I worked, there was, there were these four movies that are each, um, <laughs> Ex examining the same thing. I can't really probably say what it is yet. Um, and the thing was, it's a sciencey thing that it will make you go, oh, crying out loud. And I thought of a cool way of getting around the over crying out loud, which is probably why we were the one that lasted. It's still in production. It's been in pre-production for years. But I worked really hard with the with the writer to to make this plausible-ish, uh, a lot more plausible-ish than, than, than the original premise. And it worked. We were happy with this, this science. It was like, we were really proud of this science. And what not to do as a science advisor is when the producer comes back to you and tells you, hey, we have a cool little take on the science we think you're going to like. The the response is not, you what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never, heard from them. I never heard a word from them again. So. Um, is, there a, is there like a, a, a terrific science fact or tidbit that hasn't made it into a movie that you really want to see? Ooh. 
I mean, I, I for yeah. years I've done stage touring and science stage shows, right? And I've always wanted to find a way to help to get the audience to understand in this physical, visual way the two slit experiment on stage. I haven't written it to my satisfaction yet, wow. but like that's like a white whale for me, right? <laughs> You know, the one thing I wanted, I, we, I got for the kind of, um, and, and, you know, I, my PhD is in computational orbit dynamics. So, you know, that, so, yeah, you can give me even more crap for gravity. But um, <laughs> we did a, a, a pilot for, a, for a, um, a series that it didn't get picked up, but it was really cool. It's called Virtuality. And it was about a, a mission to uh, a nearby star system. Um, there's a, the disaster on Earth. We need to find a new place to live, essentially. And Jupiter, Neptune is the go no go point. So basically, they have an aim point. W at one aim point, they sling they go around Neptune and go um, go back to Earth. The other aim point, they get a gravity assist and they light off their Orion drive and off they go to Epsilon Eridani. Okay. So, but that what I wanted to see was someone do a gravity assist correctly. They they botch it in. Um, a couple movies, uh, uh, Sunshine. They they actually go into orbit around Mercury and then call it a gravity assist. Oh, that, that one was painful. But Sunshine is kind of a guilty pleasure. I still uh, will watch that movie. But we did it. We I actually got a, a reasonable uh, gravity assist. We talk about aim points and B planes and stuff like that. And and uh, that was back. You know, I mentioned Michael Taylor earlier. And that was Michael's did it. So he actually listens to me um, on, on that. And we did a, a reasonable gravity assist. And then we had a cool as hell Orion drive. Mm -hmm. So virtuality, it's, it had a really cool premise, and you know, it's 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 what the Battlestar people, what Galactic people did during the during the last uh, writer strike. So uh, a lot of Galactic also, people. Are, yeah. I also don't know if you have the same experience, but as I watch, like you know, over COVID, I've watched the full gamut of big blockbusters to movies that were made for about 150 bucks, and one of the things about low budget movies is that the scientists mm -hmm. almost always talk like like the language has been translated into another language and then back into English. It doesn't make any sense at all. So if you guys could tell one thing to an aspiring writer who's writing a scientist, what sort of guidance would you like to give them? Less is more. Sometimes mm -hmm. our job is done with what they don't say. <laughs> you, you talked about that earlier on um, about, you know, and, and about, you know, and, and sometimes just telling writer, no, please don't explain it. No, really. Because sometimes they're excited and they've learned this new thing. And despite being told for years to hide their exposition as well as possible, so you, 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 you're not writing a science lesson, unless of course it's a documentary. So you hide as much as possible, and, but they want to explain this. I've learned this cool thing. I want to tell the world. No, really, please don't. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, more often than, than not, just minimal on the science as possible, which sounds weird coming from a science person, but you know, we're also, that's why we do the job. Well, right. Like add, yeah, please go ahead. Two, two things. One, uh, not all scientists are engineers. They tend to conflate those two. <laughs> yes. um, and Absolutely. two, typically, if you have a PhD, you're over 23 in the WB year, years, you know, <laughs> the, 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 you know, there's, there's a bunch of 22 year old and okay, if you're a prodigy, but how many prodigy doctorates are there out there you know just just make them a little older and and one phd one no one has five phds right. just one's enough right and i would say for for engineers so here, here's the key about engineering engineering is not what about what's theoretically possible the art of engineering is being able to do for one dollar what somebody else could do for 10 and what i mean by that is if you're writing an engineer think about the engineer is going to care very much about devil being in the details are going to care very much about the practicalities of it like is the part can i make so what i really loved about like stargate was that they was that they actually sweated some of these details in the character of samantha character where she like worried about like okay it's the size of a planet. how do i make the power pack go from something the size of a planet to something that's portable because it's useless unless we can't carry it around and so shows that like that, that show kind of an evolution of technology, maybe going from a very high fluted principle into something that's practical. Um, that always says to me, oh, that's an actual engineer as opposed to yeah. say a scientist character, because there's a difference between scientists and engineers. Um, you know, sci scientists are all much. about what, what can we know that we didn't know before? And engineering is all about what can we do that we couldn't do before? And I think if you keep those two things in mind, you'll write more 
convincing scientists and engineers instead of conflating them, as I say, into this one big sci tech blob, which I think what happens a lot. And I think that's one of those things that that is could be could be better in how science and technology cultures are portrayed. I have a problem with the, the the evil scientist trope anyway, but it, the fact that You're most all evil, evil scientists are all evil engineers, really. <laughs> right, I yes. Mean, yeah. Death yeah. rays and, you know, no Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. That's a, yes. that's an engineer. That's not a scientist. <laughs> that This conflation of scientists and engineer is wonderful because one of the other things I've noticed when people write engineers is they'll be interested in one system, but not, an not another. And it's, mm -hmm. in my experience, engineers are systemic lovers. They want to know mm -hmm. all about whatever system is in front of them. Mm -hmm. they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're indiscriminate in the best way. My, my entire income is based on that tr on the truth of that fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, Discovery does that well, I think. If we're looking at something that does things well, I love the engineers on Discovery are just like, how did you make this work? How did you, mm -hmm. how did you get over this problem? How did you? Mm -hmm. I love it. I thought, that, <laughs> I thought that Benedict Wong did a magnificent job in his role in The Martian uh, oh, as the yes. scientist. And I <laughs> thought, like, that is every freaking scientist I've ever met is that, like, oh, I'm tired and yeah, we can do it, sure. Right. <laughs> well, that's just that's that's the culture of the overtime. JPL. I spent 15 yeah. years at JPL, and that's, you know, it's uh, people ask me what's the culture like there. It's like, it's like the next generation enterprise. What? I, I have to come in and work over the weekend. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, Jessica, this is a little off topic, but I have a lie detector thing I wanted to, to mention to you. <laughs> so we, we were working. We, well, because you know that we did a lie detector myth on the show. Uh, I and, did not see that one. Well, and it was Cary Grant and Tori's story to do as they wanted. It was not my story. Um, and thus, but I was super excited about it. I really wished I could have done that story. And so I had a suggestion and they didn't use it, which is totally fine. But it was around, uh, they wanted to do an event that the kid, that the, that the, uh, uh, that Tori Grant or Carrie would feel guilty about. And then they would be yeah. interviewed on a lie detector. And so they were going to go into Jamie's office and take a $20 bill out of his wallet, which, you know, granted, if Jamie doesn't know about it, that's certainly spooky to do. But I didn't think it would carry nearly the emotional response that actually stealing would. So I thought about, like, how could we ethically gain, uh, enter an emotional response into this activity? And what I came up with was we would give them a test tube full of dog poop and they'd have to smear a little bit on his computer. <gasps> Thus, they would ethically have this really difficult memory to deal with. Mm -hmm. And that's what would be potentially parsed by the lie detector. They decided not to go with it. But later when I checked with the lie detector guy, he was like, oh, that's really good. And I got my beam for like a week on that one. The scientist in me is going, wait, no, that's a confounding variable with disgust. <laughs> ah, <laughs> you know? that's totally true. Because you've got but, lie but, and guilt and disgust. And which one are you picking up this physiological response? And what is the difference between hiding disgust versus guilt, right? Like, are there different psychological physiological? I had a, I had a student who shall remain nameless who tried three times, and I think it's a three times and you're done thing to get into the, uh, a police department. I won't even identify the police department. And uh, every time he made it all the way through the basic applications and stuff, but he always fooled the lie detection. And on his last try, he asked the, the guy that was giving his polygraph technician, he asked, what, what am I failing? What am I not passing? He said, you're not passing the part about... Um, about uh, abuse of women and uh, you know and, and domestic abuse, you are showing a response there. Have you ever abused a woman? Have you ever hit a, a person mm -hmm. you've been dating? Have you ever? And he's like, I would never do that. He's like, it is the most cowardly, disgusting. He had a very noble Captain America kind mm -hmm. of heart, and it was so disgusting to him that I think that's what it was picking up <gasps> because it's it picking was spiked, up right. Right. And you can't prove guilt. That's why they're not admissible in the court of law. You can only prove that there is a physiological response when they ask that question, but you can't prove why. Wow. Yeah. Wow, there's so much food for thought in all of this. I know, that's cool stuff. <laughs> um, we have a question here uh, from Julia who wants to know, uh, what is the quantum equivalent in neuroscience? Usually when you say quantum in science fiction, you can follow it with any nonsense and it's expected oh. to be true. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to chew on that for a second. 
ask ask somebody else's study uh, story, and I will I will I will interject if I think of one. Let me add something now that we we something that Jessica broached in the beginning, and I I, I want to make sure we get in before the end. Um, yeah, please. Jessica mentioned the science and entertainment exchange, and in our first book, Steve and I mentioned it on like page two or page three, I think, in the first chapter, the exchange. And so let's talk about the exchange briefly. Um, if you are a filmmaker. Um, and you want a scientist, dial 1-844-NEED-SCI. And you will get Rick Lovert or one of his assistants. It's free. If you are a scientist and want to be a consultant. And this goes back to why I said it's a lot more benevolent than when I got in under the it's not what you know who you know, guys. Um, you, you call 1-844-NEED-SCI and you say, hey, I'm a psychopharmacologist and I want to work on Jessica Jones. Mm-hmm. Oh. And overcome, you know. So, so the the exchange, you know, they're they're based at at UCLA, not no formal connection. They just where they found office space, and one eight four four need sci. And if you're if you're a film student, you may get a grad student as your consultant. But if you're you know Pirates of the Caribbean, you get someone like me. <laughs> <laughs> I did the, no, I did. I was the science advisor. All that astronomy in the last Pirates movie was was. So with that, just with that question about what like, yeah. Jessica's thinking, I, I will say with neuroscience, neuroscience is moving right now, evolving so rapidly. So while I was writing uh, writing some of the, the biomedical stuff in the first book, at the time I was sharing an office with um, with Spectrum sort of biomedical letter, Eliza Strickland, and I had I would have this weird experience where I would write something in the chapter some previous night. One day we might be able to do this. And then I would come in and, I, and then Eliza would be working on the story about scientists have just done this. And I go, now I have to rewrite what I wrote last week night because it's just literally has gone from science fiction to science fact in the space of 24 hours. Thanks, Eliza. Um, so it, it, it really is it is insane, like how how fast I think in your science is, is moving. I think in some ways, you know, um, we're you know, you know, there's, there's a little bit of issue now with all these F, F, with fMRI results that's causing some setback. But things like optogenetics and so on, it's just mm -hmm. uh, incredible how rapidly that we are able to in, in limited conditions and the you know implant say a memory of a of a room in, in a mouse. Um, which is which is which is that there you that go. <laughs> I would love that I would love that to be made into a a, a, a movie into or incorporated mm -hmm. this 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 epigenetic memory. Mm -hmm. you know, it took a bunch of mice. They mm -hmm. gave them a scent that they had never smelled before. They gave them a shock while they smelled that smell, and then they you know when once that smell caused a, a reaction they just let them go about their lives those rats had little baby rats those rats had baby rats and when they got to the grandchild rat who had never had any exposure to this smell they gave them the smell and they were statistically more afraid of that smell than other rats why Amazing. What kind of like mm -hmm. what 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 memory got handed down what trace what you know mm -hmm. that that i would love to see epigenetics Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 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 at TED years ago, Ricardo Sabatini stood up on stage with Craig Ventner's entire genome sequence in 129 phone books. <laughs> and he opened up this page and was like, here, these 12 characters are the color of his eyes. The rest of this, we have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there. Um, one of the points we're going to make in the third book is that you know, we have neuroscience, we have psychology, and in not too distant future, they're going to be synonymous because um, I'm speaking for Jessica. While she's still, are you still thinking, Jess? Or are you, are you, were you? What? Yeah, they're separate. Okay. They're separate, separate chapters. Separate yeah, chapters. Separate chapters in our book, but but in the not too distant future, they're not going to be separate. But by because because you know, either by psychiatry giving somebody a drug or therapy, which causes you to emit your own drugs it's all about getting you know it's all drug treatment one way or the other um so so psychology and neuros psychology is going to go away but keeping psychology separate allows us to talk about hannibal and jess and i are both big fans <laughs> um i you know we're 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 past time which is fine again i could do this for hours but i, I wanted to finish with this is you guys are 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 not omniscient. I'm sure you get questions you don't know the answers to. I would love to hear your process of how you research an answer to a question you don't know. www.google.com. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, but surely you call me... someone and check with them. You Ask know, your doctor if getting information off the internet is right, right. for you. <laughs> you know, as many Wikipedia snobs as are out there, um, it's there's always a lot of great references at the bottom. So even if the mm. you, you can't trust the bulk of it, you go to the references at the bottom, and they're usually pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, that's, as, a, that's, a, that's a, a, a journalist. It's it's it, yeah. It's it's not so much Wikipedia, but it's it is the sources. And then who wrote those sources? And then and maybe there's somebody I, I can call. So I'm I, you know yeah, calling people or emailing people. People are usually very generous uh, with 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 their time. Um, and um, you can find that yeah, you can. It's just talking to people is is, is a great way. I'm lucky enough to be part of a university because I'm teaching and so I have access to the library references. So I just hit the, the medical journal straight up and just start reading. Yeah. I, I mean, the thing that I learned from Mythbusters um, doing all the weird bits of research was that the internet is not the compendium of ill human knowledge. It's the rough mm. outline. It's the mm-hmm. index or it's at least like 5% of the index and you can mm-hmm. go find the rest through there. And the yeah. signal to noise is about 1.1. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yeah. right, but there are a lot of really good databases that are not like necessarily that so you know for instance i'll use the ieee explore database which is at the very least anybody can see like the abstracts for free and oftentimes like i'll, I'll get the answer to what i need from because especially if i'm writing for like for hollywood science and stuff like this often that's enough to like get me in the, in the abstract is to get me in the right direction so i would say yeah don't be afraid of like learning how to read abstracts and um from all of these like science databases because the abstracts are free and if you really want to you can you can look at it or maybe you can get a library you can go and if you're you know municipal library in new york you can often get access to the full articles through your public library ask and find out it, there are ways to get around it if you're not like lucky enough to be uh, sort of in a university setting and if you get them then you, then you do what's called the grad school read <laughs> abstract conclusion and maybe the methods yeah <laughs> i will tell you as the person with the least amount of education in this quartet i will tell you and 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 that my method for reading an abstract is my same for reading a contract it's mystifying on the first pass but after like the fourth read through it starts to crystallize into something and then i can ask a not ridiculous question of someone mm-hmm. who understands mm-hmm. exactly and you're right, actually, uh, Kevin. I agree, uh, Stephen. Sorry, I. You know, when I when I have called scientists all over the world to ask uh, what tribology is or how to do this or that, uh, they're incredibly generous with their time. No one ever minds answering a, a, a question. <laughs> because you guys, talk about their science. They, they always talk about exactly. their own science. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kevin, Stephen, Jessica, thank you guys so much. Uh, I, it's been a pleasure to talk. Again, I could do this for hours, and I really can't wait until we're at some physical con together. Uh, in, in, so See you can have con. this conversation. Dragon right con. Dragon con. Dragon con. <laughs> okay. Is Dragon con happening in 21? I, I think I, so. I'll be vaccinated by then. You know, yeah. I think we all will be. I got my second talking. one yesterday. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. Yay. Well, thank you guys so much. Science. Thank you. Thank you. Making our world more interesting every day. It was just delightful.